us. My name is Jordan, and uh, we're excited to lead you in some worship. The words will be up on the screen, and I encourage you guys to worship your Father.
lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice, I will bring a sacrifice, lay me down. Come on. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Oh, and on my heart this much is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me joy it'll be my joy to say your will your way it'll be my joy to say your will your way it'll be my joy to say your will your way always it'll be my joy Your will, your way, always. Lay me down. I lay me down. I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down. Lay me Shout to him. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. Put me back together Every desire Now satisfied Here in your love You guys sing it Oh, there's nothing and flaws 
Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing, oh, better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Cause there's nothing. in the gardens you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you're the only one who can let's lift him up there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, oh. We praise you, Lord. You're good to us. in Jesus' name. 
Christ's name. Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Father's Day, by the way, and to you mothers that are taking up both roles of parenthood. Heavenly Father, bless fathers and all fathers' figures with such love and faithfulness that children flourish and grow in uprightness and joy. Bless those who long to be fathers and for those whom this day is difficult. Praise the Lord. We, we play a breast blessing over Jubilee. Zook, building relationships in East Africa. Heavenly Father, keep the Holy Spirit growing in Africa and with Jubilee. And for our team is in the Rosebud Mission, we pray for their safety. And we pray for them to reach out to many. We pray that they have a revival of many coming, coming in their way. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you today. Uh, today is our day to collect these baby bottles that you might have heard of. Now, if you forgot it at home, you can still bring it in this week. 
but between Mother's Day and Father's Day every year, we uh, try to fill baby, baby bottles with change for our local pregnancy center that helps moms that maybe are struggling in their pregnancy, and you, you know that whole thing. And so it's called Tri-County Life Care Center. It's right here in Osceola. And if you have it, bring it up today or bring it to the office um, this week. I've got a particular treat for you. I've asked three men to come up and be on a panel for me. And so if each of you three guys would grab a chair and bring it up here, we'll see who's going to be humble and have the little bit lower chair there. I realize that's a play. So please come on up. Yeah, I know they're all going to grab it. <laughs> By the way, any children that would want to be in Children's Church are dismissed now, and you're welcome to do that. So awesome. Dads, we're proud of you. And uh, um, well, actually, just right there, right in a row. And would like for each of you to have a microphone if that's possible. So, here's one. There you go. All right, thank you guys. This is a little scary to get up here and have to ask, answer questions, but uh, they're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, if you answer really well, you'll get a prize. All right, our first question today has to do with who you are, so if you can tell us who you are and the names and ages of your children. All right, uh, I'll go first. My name is Adam Martin, and I have two sons. Emmett, he's 16, brand new driver, break his truck already, and Cameron is 10, a little baseball player. Super athlete, all star. All right. <laughs> I'm Jordan. I have three boys uh, Jetson, Jameson, and Jackman, who are six, three, and one. All right. I'm Joshua Slightburn, and I have four boys. I just noticed that. We all have How one. did this happen? <laughs> it wasn't planned. So <laughs> we have two, three, and four boys represented. <laughs> so Mike is my oldest, he's nine. I have Elliot, seven years old, Winston. By the way, he was born on the same day as Winston Churchill, uh, is five, and then Simeon is age three. All right. Okay, thank you guys, and thanks for being with us today. Uh, the next question is, how is being a father different from what you thought it would be? Perhaps when you were single and looked forward to being a dad. What, what's been unique now that you've had some kids and been doing it a while? Well, pre-fatherhood, I didn't really have a clue about or even a thought about being a father so it was a lot different than I wasn't expecting because I wasn't thinking about it at all and uh, I thought I was just gonna go on with life as usual and it turns out that God put somebody in my life to correct that thought process <laughs> uh, I have learned a lot of valuable lessons though and it's just uh, it's been a great journey so far Okay. Yeah, I guess I thought I would change or that I like something different would happen to me. Like as soon as you become a, a dad, you're a new person, like everything changes for you. And I just, it's, it's really not that, for, it wasn't as different as I thought. It's just a bunch of little minions running around the house now. Right? So, um, so for me, I thought that there would be more instant change, like I'm suddenly this new person, but maybe that just happens over time. So for me, I'm a fairly high energy person, or at least used to be, um, but it takes a lot of energy to raise uh, kids, boys. Um, so nighttime, getting ready for bed is just like, it's a slog like every night and like for an hour, hour and a half, it's just like, it wears you down. But you know, it's a blessing obviously, but that, that, that was a surprise to me. <laughs> Continues to be a surprise. Thank you guys. Next question is, was there anything that your dad, or if it wasn't a dad, a father figure, grandfather, maybe whatever, a, a dad father figure for you, that taught you, that has helped you to be a better dad or father? Well, my dad owned a motorcycle shop growing up, um, and one of my really, really valuable memories is helping him build a, a World War II era Harley Davidson. And I, I was young enough that I didn't really know what was going on, but I do remember putting the engine in and starting it for the first time. Just amazing. And what I learned is you can build things with your own hands and make it work. And uh, just how awesome that is. And that if you stick to something 
and think through the process and just have patience that it'll all work out. If you don't know, that is my dad. <laughs> he must be fishing for compliments or something. I don't know. <laughs> No, just a good Father's Day present would be enough. <laughs> Quick, someone go on Amazon. <laughs> no. Um, no, but actually, in this environment here, he's my pastor, and so he's not my dad here. And out there, he's not my pastor. He's my dad out there. So even here, I'll call him Pastor Larry, and out there, I call him Dad. Um, and so it's been cool to, to, for our relationship to grow kind of in that way. But um, this it's going to sound probably weird and esoteric, but um, he taught me how to be present and where a lot of other maybe friends that I had, like their, if their dad was still in their life, he was so off into his own world that the, he wasn't really present. Or, you know, obviously the product of divorce was half of my friends, right? So he showed me how to be present and, and to this day, I've never thought in my mind, not for a single moment, about not being with Julia or not being with them. Like the, the divorce doesn't even make sense in my head. It's not even a, mm -hmm. an option, right? So taught me how to be present with them, and, and that's been really helpful. Yeah, for me, it's uh, my dad certainly taught me by example, uh, dedication to family. Um, so always there, um, you know, whether it's doing work outside, uh, teaching us the work ethic. My brother and I uh, went to our hockey games, uh, volunteered to do things. Um, and then more recently, just kind of learning to view things multi-generationally. So my father's currently making decisions uh, intentionally that are going to impact his grandchildren uh, mm -hmm. and beyond. And I think that's just really, you know, a really amazing uh, example of, uh, again, just that multi-generational uh, viewpoint of things. Because you know, life is beyond just us, right? And we're, we're looking forward to the com coming generations. So, Thanks, guys. Before we have one final question. I meant to say earlier, um, as was prayed, Brian prayed, this can be a tough day for some people. Uh, my own dad has passed away. Some of you have had that. Some of you didn't have a father figure. We want to fully recognize there's grace and mercy for all of us, right? And maybe we went through a divorce, and uh, we can't be as present with our children as we'd like to be. But we can still be good dads, right? And, um, you know, somebody, I don't know, rightly so or not, said, you know, a father is, you can father a child and not be a dad. But um, a dad is someone that invests in their child. And, um, and so we can start doing that even today. And of course, I don't know if you can see this or not. I put this in um, for us older guys. Um, great dads get promoted to grandpa. So, and to encourage you, okay, let's have an honest, raise a hand if you're a grandparent here, a dad. Look at that, yeah. Look at how many grandparents there are. So, um, so very thankful. And, you know, uh, what was mentioned about absenteeism, we, we see in our culture where that has really hurt us. Young men don't know how to be young men um, in so many cases. And um, we can't blame them if they don't act what we think is a godly man. So we, we just want to raise up a generation uh, of people that have a better chance, you know, than maybe what they had that maybe aren't as abandoned as that last generation in every culture, in every strata, right? So I did have um, just a final question that's kind of more open-ended for you guys. Uh, as we kind of wrap this up, is there any last thought or word you'd like to share with these folks? I mean, you got a microphone, run with it, that you, know, you think might be helpful or encouraging. Well, yeah, I'll build off of what Larry was saying. I, I see so many guys at my work and just people, guys in public, that don't know how to act. And it's because they didn't have somebody to teach them how to act and just the small lessons. Um, in life and being able to share that time with a younger man is so valuable uh, to be able to pass that along in uh, not just to my own kids but to their friends also as uh, I'm going to be a camp counselor here at the end of July and um, that, that's the first thought the, the second second thought I would say is to make time. I get carried away with all the chores around the house. I have an endless honey-do list. And uh, to, to take time just playing catch with Cameron, helping him hit a ball. And uh, same thing with Emmett, you know, he's interested in mechanics. It, that, that fits me pretty well. So I have no problem spending time in the garage. I just take that time and be there with them. I think the biggest challenge of fatherhood is that they never turn the dang lights off. Ever. 
it's so the trick that I found is to unscrew all the bulbs in the house. <laughs> <laughs> they can never turn them on. So <laughs> no, but uh, I, I heard this. Um, I heard this. Uh, someone from who was probably seventy or eighty years, eight years old, and he's and someone asked him the question like, "What was what was the greatest joy or purpose in your life?" Is that he, he said, "I could I can look back and and honestly say that I never had a moment of regret." And so I think about that moment now, if anyone is not yet a father or maybe you're a young dad or, or something of, of young kids, I mean, yeah, it's a challenge, but I also call it the most beautiful challenge of your life. It's the most wonderful challenge of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I never want to get to that stage. And I'm right now planning and every day actively choosing that how I behave today, I'm going to be thankful for when I'm 70 or 80, that I would never abandon them. I was always with them, even if that meant that they, <laughs> and they do multiple times a week, take me away from work for hours on, on end to go do other things that I'm never gonna regret that time either. Um, so I think that that was big for me. And so if we can intentionally live a life with no regrets, I think that starts with a decision to behave as we will now and, uh, and really spend that intentional time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna borrow that, that word intentional. So um, for myself and, and my wife, Katie, we, um, we're intentional in how we pray for our children. We, we don't do this perfectly, mm -hmm. but so there's two things that we really pray for consistently. One is uh, wisdom as parents. Um, so I've said before that it's not enough to love your children. You, you have to have wisdom when you raise children. Um, there's too many pitfalls in this world. Um, there's too many parents with good intentions who harm their children. Um, so praying for wisdom, seeking God's wisdom uh, regularly. Uh, and the second thing is uh, really pray that God would uh, draw our children's hearts to him. Um, we're very intentional in that. Um, you know, God needs to be part of the process, you know, and we invite him into that process. So that's what I would uh, say as a piece of advice. Amen. I'd love for us just to pray over our dads and with our dads um, and, and grandpas. And um, so if you have one near you, you just want to put a hand on a shoulder, pray for these three guys that have been so gracious up here. And, you know, there's no magic to it. It's following biblical principles here and just... Um, being what our Heavenly Father is to us. So let's bow our head. Father, it's with great joy that we hear from these three fine gentlemen here and want to receive. And there'd be many more lessons if we could um, just probe into the lives of each dad or granddad here. But we would ask your blessing, Lord. We would ask that the Holy Spirit would descend upon us on this day and give us the strength, the wisdom, the power to do what's right. There are times as men that we just have to forge forge ahead not knowing exactly what's going to come but you've put placed a specific call in our life sometimes to provide sometimes to protect sometimes to be really kind and sometimes to be more stern and all of that's part of being a dad i commit um all of us to your care and pray it'd be a very special day for these fine group of guys and i appreciate each of them in jesus name do you say a big amen to that Hey, I'd love for you to stand up and high-five somebody, get to know a name. Go ahead. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you. You bet. Okay, 20 seconds. <laughs> All right, if you could find your seat, that'd be great. Appreciate you.
Well, we spent the past several days, Kelly and I, in uh, Asheville, uh, North Carolina. I thought it was safe because, you know, there's a north and a south, and since I'm kind of a northerner, I thought I could talk like a northerner in North Carolina. But you can't, and so I told everybody, I don't want to come home with this. The southern accent is easy to, to adapt, I mean, really. So you, get, you start talking like, like about day two. And so you don't say you there, you know what you say. Y'all, yeah, y'all. So I'm trying to keep that out of my brain. Hi, y'all. Um, and it's, it's pretty, pretty regular. I didn't meet anybody do down there that didn't speak that way. The other thing I noticed is that we speak Every word that ends with ing wrong, you're not looking, you're looking. And you're not going, you're going. And you're not jumping, you're jumping. <laughs> but they do have a beautiful sense of hospitality down there, and we learned a lot about um, uh, the conference that we went to was about release time Bible education. Really got filled with a lot of great ideas. If you don't know, our, we just finished our first year in a pilot program at our local school and hope to expand it to where more school districts can actually, during the school day, it's totally legal, with parental permission, we can pick up kids, take them off-site, teach them a good Bible lesson, and send them back. And really, the question I had to face after all, all of it is, do I care enough about the public school students to do something about it? It's, it's easy to say I care. But do I care enough to do something? Now, they, you can do Bible clubs before and after school, but our vision is actually to invade the system during the school day to pull kids out. You know what it is? It's a simple statement of saying they need the Bible. That math and all the other classes, I'm not, I don't even remember, history, English, and all that, is not enough to create a good citizen. Our students today need the Bible. And if you were to go outside of this room and ask the residents even of Osceola or beyond what percentage of children were in church today to learn, you'd probably be in the 10% range. Yeah. The statistics show not even 20% of Americans will be in a church today, not even 20% around America. People will tell you they go to church regularly and all the, you know, they've got these particular polls that go out. But regularly anymore is once or twice a month if they're regular. Okay, Children are not getting biblical education, and it is the Bible that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, able to divide and expose and show us the thoughts and intents of the heart. No other book can do that. So that's why we need dads to teach the Bible at home. But we've got a whole... We've got a harvest field next door or in our school system. So if you're interested in helping, we're going to keep pressing on. It's not an easy field. I would say many within the system don't want this to happen because they don't see the value of the Bible. I happen to see the value of the Bible. I find that a hill we're dying on. And uh, believe me, if you jump on this hill, you just might. But the truth is, these kids are worth it. We feel like these kids are worth it, okay? So, uh, if I slip into some southern talking here, forgive me. I'm sure it'll go away within a week or two, <laughs> unless I go back there. But hello from our brethren in Asheville, North Carolina. I've been kind of working my way through some passages in the book of Acts. And, um, and thankful, thankful for you guys that came up and shared. I'm not going to be preaching on fatherhood. I'm going to be preaching on boldness for us all. And I think dads need to be bold, but so do moms. And I'm going to be talking out of Acts chapter 3 and 4 if you have a Bible. And I would love for you to follow along. By the way, for those of you that aren't aware, I do a fo follow-up Bible study on every sermon that I email to you every week if we have your email. Or there's a slot right next to our um, door, the office door, that you can get a follow-up Bible study and either study it yourself and go a little deeper or meet with your um, small group. Well, before I got started, uh, Jesse, I was going to congratulate you and Gary, and then he ran outside the door. Well, Jesse's here. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> Gary and Jesse got married last week. That explained them not being here last Sunday. Doggone it. What kind of commitment do you have anyway? But <laughs> Uh, they got married on Saturday. They weren't here Sunday, but they are here today, and we're glad to have you together as a married couple. Yeah. And you'll have to tell him I did this, because I'm not going to do it again, so just so you know. We're in Acts chapter 3. Here's what the scripture says. 
One day, Peter and John, and Peter and John are apostles. You know, they followed, they were one of the twelve, the ones of the twelve that followed Jesus. They went to the temple at the time of prayer, okay? So the temple in Jerusalem was the main worship center for all the Jewish people around the world. They would come by there if they lived locally often, or they would come three times a year there for about a week of celebration um, for things like the Passover or Pentecost or the Feast of Tabernacles. Those three they pretty much had to come to. Okay, so Peter and John, apostles, are going at the time of prayer. Now, you may not be aware of it, but the Jewish people had regular times of prayer, besides just like you and I have a prayer whenever we want to, but morning, afternoon, and evening, and this was an afternoon prayer, which most people believe was, you know, around three-ish in the afternoon if they could get to the temple. And so they're just going to pray. I mean, I don't know how you feel when you go to a prayer meeting. I just, well, I pray. I'm supposed to pray. I believe God. I don't think they knew this was going to happen. So it's three in the afternoon, and a man was lame from birth being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. They gave each gate a name. Where he was put every day to beg from those, uh, from those going into the temple courts. So we were just in Asheville. Anytime you get into a southern area where it's often good weather, um, you'll find a lot of people that are begging on the street corners. And every street corner um, were people that were homeless. We saw a lot of that the past few days. Um, and so this guy was just laid at the gate to be able to make a living. He couldn't walk. And um, so Peter and John come by them. And, of course, they just dug in their pocket and got a couple of shekels out and dropped it in his bucket, didn't they? No. He begged them for money, but Peter looked at him, as did John, and said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold, I don't have. I just went to church and put it all in the offering. No, he didn't say that. (laughs) But what I do have, I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Walk. Taking this man by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly this man's feet and ankles became strong. This begs the question whether the man got healed when Peter kind of declared it or when he grabbed him by the hand. I don't know when it happened. It'd be an interesting study whether that healing was instantaneous just by Peter proclaiming it or lifting him up by the hand. Because, you know, both took a step of faith, didn't they? To say that out loud was a huge step of faith. And to grab him by the hand, you know, you wouldn't go to the average person in a wheelchair to yank him out unless you thought God had done something, right? So, so they, he instantly put him, pulled him up, and the man's feet and ankles on the way up, I guess, became strong. And verse 8 says, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Now, remember when he started to be lame was from birth. The man has never walked. And if you go further down, it says he was 40 years old or over 40 years old at that time. The man had never walked. Seen people walk by him every day, probably saying, I wish I could walk. I wish I could do that, but he couldn't do it. So he jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them, came with them into the prayer meeting. I bet that would be an exciting prayer meeting. Everyone around, it says, they recognized him as the same man uh, who was walking and praising God he was, that had been sitting at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what God had happened to him. Uh, God had done to him, what had happened to him. So, think about it. Guy's lame, his people, parents, friends, whatever, lay him at the gate beautiful, expecting to get a few dollars. Peter and John come by, uh, said, hey, we don't have any money, but how about if you could walk? They, we would probably just pray over him, but they felt that God wanted to heal him, raised him up, and the guy says he would, the guy not only got healed and walked around, but was walking like this, jumping and praising God. Okay. Well, think about if you had been lame all your life. I mean, what would your reaction be? You know, you wouldn't be just saying, oh, thanks, God, see you later. No, you're walking. Something that never happened to you. You can be like others around you. Okay, so people recognized who this man was, and that was a problem because there were others watching that we're going to have to talk about here in a moment, and that is the religious leaders. Notice first that the beggar got what he needed, not what he wanted. There may be times where you need to help somebody in a way that's different from the way that they want to be helped, and it might actually be 
better. You know, if, he'd have, if Peter would have thrown a few shekels in the bucket, um, those would be gone at the end of the day, right? The guy would probably get something to eat. But now his whole life was altered. His whole life was altered. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. If you're looking in your uh, bulletin, the Holy Spirit and evangelism. And I think all of us have a desire here to touch people for Christ, to make a difference in their lives. And each of you do it a slightly different way. This became an opportunity to lead not just this man to Christ, but many that experienced this. And so I think you would agree, as you look at this passage, this, <clears throat> this was not just a witnessing moment where, where you said, hey, do you know Jesus loves you? This was a power encounter with a man that had a need and administering the gospel through that need. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it was a power uh, encounter. It leads me to believe that we need the Holy Spirit more than we know in our witnessing. We need the supernatural for him to show up. So uh, think about it. This was a healing, and a lot of times Jesus healed and got people's attention, and they're called signs and wonders in the Bible. What he did was signs and wonders. Sometimes it was a casting out of an evil spirit. That got people's attention, and then he ministered the word to them. It can even happen in a church service. I don't know if you're aware of it, but if something supernatural were to happen here, and it doesn't have to be flamboyant. Let's just say that somebody's here today, and I don't know your need, and I happen to say something that I couldn't have known, and I don't know, but it's something you've been praying about, thinking about, dealing with, struggling with. And I've had people come up and say, how did you know that? And I don't. I'm not that smart. But the truth is the Holy Spirit knew it, and so it was a supernatural moment for you. And in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, when prophecy or words like that come forth, people who are unlearned or maybe don't know the Lord yet will say, God is certainly among you. There is no way you could have known that I was thinking about that or, or just had that experience or knew that. And that's the kind of services that we want because there's a sense of conviction in that. Conviction's not a bad thing, you guys. Conviction is how God gets us better. He just says, this is something I want you to work on. This is how I'm improving your life. What you're doing, though, think about your part in that. Now, I mean, I'll just mention here, but it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Your presence, your activity, let's just say in a worship setting like this, you worshiping God with all of your heart can be greatly affecting somebody in your row because maybe they're not worshiping God with all their heart. Maybe, maybe it's been a bad day. Maybe they need to see faith in action, and you being fully alive in Christ is affecting people, and it's not that you're looking to do it right. I actually added a G, looking to do that. Um, you're just being you, but it's the best you. It's the you that's fully alive in Christ. What about a greeter? You know, you can have bad greeters, or you can have good greeters. Maybe a greeter that just is super welcoming, you know, just something that that greeter said or did or the way they presented themselves in such a way that made that person think, wow, I haven't been talked to like that all week, and that kind of thing. And whether it's in children's ministry or how our praise team presents or all of us, we can all have a part in this supernatural sense of meeting needs so that it eventually leads to salvation for people. Do you see that? That you're not just some bump on the log. You're part of the big, the big plan. Well, Peter and John were just willing vessels. In fact, Peter makes it really clear in these passages that he said, I didn't do this. I didn't heal you. It's not because I'm some apostle. It's the name of Jesus Christ that healed you. So you just have to be a willing vessel. We all fit into the program of God, and we all need it to be supernatural. Us, uh, on some intelligence trip, we're not going to convince people just by speaking the right words. We need the Spirit of God if we're going to be um, willing vessels. And then we take advantage of the moment if we see that God's actually touching somebody's heart. So Peter, and I want you to catch my heart on this, Peter could have started a healing crusade right then. Do you hear that? Peter could have said, hold it, there's one. Come on, you guys, God wants to heal you. He didn't do that. I want you to be stunned by that because there was something bigger than healing on the plate. People weren't saved. The healing happened. It got the attention of the people. Now you minister the gospel. He could have done it. And there would have been nothing wrong. But the truth is those people weren't saved. And even if their bodies got healed, that didn't mean they'd go to heaven someday. Heaven is the goal. Right. You're going to die someday. I hope that's not news to you. You're going to die someday. 
And then I want you to die with the full confidence that you're going right to your heavenly father. We have a good, good father, right? So Peter turns it into an opportunity to share a message, an opportunity to preach Jesus. I don't care what miracle it is, what supernatural thing it is. That sign and wonder was meant to point toward the saving power of Jesus Christ. Fellow Israelites, he says in verse 12, why does this surprise you that somebody got healed? Why do you stare at us if it's a, as if it's our power of godliness who made this man walk? Now, what he's going to say now is specific to Jewish people. He's reading his crowd right. He, they would have understand these. A lot of Gentiles wouldn't have, but he ministers to this crowd specifically. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Here's where he gets a little tough. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. That was Barabbas. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can see. And so I'm sure he's pointing to the man. Now, fellow Israelites, that's his crowd, Jewish people at the moment, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through the prophets, by the way, the prophets they believed in and read constantly, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. To who? Well, to them. And that he may send the Messiah who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets, for Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. So a Jewish guy is going to be raised up like Moses. You must listen to everything he tells you, and anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. So Peter is sharing the message. <laughs> There comes a point when you have a relationship with somebody, even if you just started one on the bus or the plane or a longtime friend that came over for coffee, there comes a point where you're going to have to cross the line and ask the question. That's when the butterflies start to go all different directions, that kind of thing. Um, you're a believer. They, excuse me. They maybe aren't. <clears throat> they uh, know you're a believer, but you've never really crossed the line with the question, Okay. They maybe even have seen the change in you, which is miraculous, but you've never gotten there. And we all face it. We all need an extra shot of courage right then because that would be the point where you need to talk about Jesus. How, how are you doing with the Lord? If someone, let's just say even a person got sick or got cancer or, you know, got some bad news, are you ready to meet Jesus? Sure, I'm going to pray for healing and belief, but are you ready to meet Jesus? That's it. You know, people get all weirded out about all these end times events, and I, you know, I think we should, you know, obviously be concerned. But there's one question. Are you ready to meet the Lord? If you're ready to meet the Lord, your soul is clean, you're walking in righteousness, you didn't just pray some sinner's prayer. You're right with God. You know that. When you wake up in the morning, it, it's the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you. You're alive. And, 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 and you're healed in the sense that sin is not the strength of your life. You know, when, you, when you're a sinner, that's the thing you do, and that's the thing you look forward to doing. But now righteousness is the strength of your life and the focus of your life. You want to do right, you want to see right. And so Jesus is your healer. Like this man got healed from the lameness, we have been healed from the lameness of our brokenness in sin. Would you agree? And listen, we are fighting life and death battles. If we could see, if we could part the heavens right now and see the clashing of swords in heavenly places where, for instance, we've prayed and demonic powers have maybe tried to hold back an answer to prayer. It happened in Daniel's life, and so you keep pressing in. There are demonic powers out there that want to resist what you and I believe in, and we don't want to um, wrestle people. That's what Paul kind of said. You don't, don't put people's faces on the dartboard. They're not the issue. They're just being used. No, you wrestle against principalities and powers and world forces of darkness. And it, it kind of, on our trip away uh, to North Carolina, it, it, somebody preached a little bit on that, and I thought, well, hold it. Paul used the word wrestle, and I've seen some of our kids wrestle, and they did very well. 
But wrestling isn't kind of a, okay, kind of a thing. No, you're, is, they're like this, right? Right? And they're looking for the right move. And there's a little sweat and people are yelling and, and you know, take them down. Well, do, is that what our prayer looks like? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but even in the English, it would indicate we do wrestle something. So our prayer life should be like wrestling, just not the way we used to. To get down and dirty with God. Boy, I love those kinds of prayer meetings. A shout fest to God. Get into it. Holy Ghost and power. Wow. Yeah. You should goosebumps thinking about it. Well, Jesus had healed a man, and Peter used it for the gospel's sake. And for these people that were expecting the Messiah, he used that information. Like, hey, you Jews out there, you've been expecting a Messiah to come. Guess what? He was here. You missed him. <laughs> he, was just, <laughs> he was just walking on the earth for 33 years. You crucified him. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and and, and he, boldness doesn't mean meanness. It just means truth. Speaking the truth in love. You don't have to become harsh and beat up people. I don't think Peter was beat. He was one of the Jews, right? But he's saying that we crucified the one that brought the message of life. And so he gives an answer for that. He says, hey, I know you guys were ignorant. I know you didn't know who Jesus was. But now you do. It, this whole thing that just happened has been, the, the sign and the wonder has happened to get your attention so that you can receive the gospel, and accept Christ in your life. Your Messiah is here. Of course, the Jews had a little bit of a false sense about the Messiah, and that was that he would free them from Rome, and uh, that was not true. He freed them from a far more hideous enemy, their own sin. So basically what Peter winded up saying is, hey, it's a wicked world. You can be saved from the wickedness of the world and your own wicked ways. He actually uses those words your own wicked ways. And I will tell you, by the time you can say that about yourself, you're ready to be saved. Because, you know, typically in America, everybody else is bad. You know, or certainly I don't think of myself as wicked because I'm a little better than that guy next door. But when you see yourself, yourself, your ways, your selfishness, you know, your desires for the world more than God, you can really repent and say, Lord, heal me from my wicked ways, okay? And Jesus can do that. Uh, so it says, indeed, beginning with Samuel, Samuel and all the prophets. Remember, they believed in the Old Testament, so he used the Old Testament. Uh, he spoke of these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and the covenant God made with your fathers. For he said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on the earth will be blessed. And when God raised up a servant, he sent him to you, Jews, first, by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So no pulls, uh, punches pulled. He just told them the truth. You need to be saved. Okay, so you would think, hey, hoorah, right? Peter and John, their ministry, somebody got healed. They got to witness to people. It says in here that now the crowd raised up to 5,000. They had just over 3,000 a few days earlier on the day of Pentecost. Now the church is 5,000. People are accepting um, this message. Everybody should be happy. Well, I mentioned there were some Jewish leaders on the scene, and they weren't so happy. So in chapter 4, it uses the words, greatly disturbed. The religious leaders were greatly disturbed. Could you all look at me with a greatly disturbed face for a second? What's a greatly disturbed face? Well, a greatly disturbed face comes from a greatly disturbed spirit. And they were really bothered that, first of all, they were losing control of the crowd and that maybe Peter was implying they needed to be saved too. So it says in chapter 4, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people, like right in the middle of Peter's sermon. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed, who believed grew to 5,000. And, and usually they counted men, so there was more than 5,000 plus wives and children, Okay. I find something interesting here, and I hope you picked up on it. None of the religious leaders were happy that this man had been healed. Nobody said, wow, this guy for 40 years has been dragged up to the temple and holding a tin can and barely making it, and isn't it great he got healed? 
No, they were all concerned about their own selfish need to stay in control and, and really not to let the truth um, hit their own heart. They didn't want to hear the truth, and darkness doesn't want to hear the truth. And I can tell you, one of the most deceiving spirits in the world is a religious spirit, because religious spirits think they've got it all together. And I love ticking off religious spirits. It happens here quite often. You know, where I'll say something, and I just believe in my freedom in Christ. And, you know, I, I want to say something about being a public speaker. Many of you wouldn't want to be up here. Maybe some of you do, and you have publicly spoken. I can imagine Peter now sitting in jail overnight, him and John, just thinking, as I or you might think, it's like, oh, man, I should have said it better. If you're in public speaking, you think about these kinds of, man, I, I wish I could have kept their attention, or there was an illustration I forgot, or there must be something wrong with how I presented the truth, right? You always second-guess yourself. There was nothing wrong with Peter's presentation. He, otherwise, the Bible would have addressed it and said, ah, Peter kind of messed up. He got thrown in jail because he did the right thing, right? So always doing the right thing doesn't always bring immediately the right results, although people were um, getting saved. So when people become more religious than Christ-like, darkness creeps in, and that darkness hates the light, and, and Jesus wants to shine that flashlight of his righteousness on it to eradicate it. And it can come up in a million different ways about like how that person dressed or who didn't say hi to me or how come that person didn't go to church today or all those different things. A million different judgmental thoughts can come up. And it allows darkness in, and we need to repent of that as well. So Peter and John are just hanging out in jail, staying clean, probably singing like Paul and Silas did. And um, the next day they bring them out. When they bring them out, they accuse them. Again, no congratulations on the wonderful miracle. And um, they just attack, attack, attack them for doing the right thing. One thing I learned from this story is that not everyone is going to believe us. And not everyone's going to remain neutral about what we believe. Hello? So not everyone's going to believe what we believe. And not everyone out there is going to remain neutral. They're going to attack. In fact, some of them can become rather inflamed with their desire to see you uh, and your message eradicated. I thought, maybe having read through the story several times, why didn't those religious leaders, after putting the guys in, guy in jail all night, just sit him down and talk to him? But they didn't just talk to them. Why couldn't they have a rational discussion like, well, you believe this, we believe this, how come we're having problems here? It seems to always be inflamed because there's a spirit behind it. Okay, here's some life lessons. Threats against you come from people who feel threatened. Think about it. Threats against you, because of your faith, come from people who feel threatened. They're not coming from a point of strength. There's a fear there somewhere. Either that your group's going to grow or that you are right or something. People, and we will do really strange things when we feel threatened. Boy, will we ever. So people that threaten you, as with Peter and John, they're being threatened. Um, we're being threatened by people uh, who really had insecurities inside, okay? And secondly, those often lead to accusations from people that are hiding something inside that they're not dealing with. And so f really for you and I to be helpful to those people, I mean, we can keep them over there and us over here, but we got to believe that their soul can be touched too. You've got to take kind of a you know, uh, innocent like a dove and wise like a serpent approach, you know. Serpents still bite, but they bite the right time and the right way, right? So you got to be like a serpent. When you apply the gospel, and I've blown it plenty of times, you want to apply it at the point where they've maybe already had some questions answered and you're not attacking them. You can't win somebody to Christ that you hate. So if you hate them just because they're of a certain group, um, in fact, even not as bad as hate, you're not, you're not going to want to witness to somebody who you haven't learned to be compassionate about. So if you're struggling maybe with a political party or a certain group in, in America, that's the place to pray and say, God, give me compassion for them because I'm never going to win them with the attitude that I have. Right? Amen. Okay. Peter. <laughs> And usually, when arguments get inflamed, they never go anywhere, do they? It's horrible. Uh, so we don't need an argumentation. Uh, we just need to rationally talk about what truth is. 
So Peter then took this opportunity to preach again. I mean, he got a bunch of them in the kingdom the day before, but now having been in jail, he got another message today. Here's what he said. Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, and know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. That's actually a quote out of a psalm. Salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven uh, given to mankind by which you must be saved. I'm going to wrap this up with this thought. Psalm 118, verse 22 is what I just read. The stone the builders rejected, okay? That was a psalm that they used in the Passover celebration um, as they were celebrating all that God had done and getting them out of, out of Egypt. When the Jews celebrate the Passover Seder, they, they say that exact verse, Psalm 118, 22, as part of the Seder when they lift up, guess what? The cup of redemption. The cups each have a different name. So what Peter was saying, Psalm 118, 22, was they all knew it verbatim. The stone the builders rejected or refused has now become the head of the corner, following up a common myth that when the temple got rebuilt that the cornerstone was either lost or put aside because it had become so destroyed by the fire when you know, Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem that they had to bring it in to complete the building. And one Jewish man who accepted Christ said, Oh, if a Jewish worshiper could only see that this psalm is about the Messiah, the slain Passover lamb, whose blood became the atonement for our sin. So Psalm 118, the, in the previous verse, um, he says, really cast God's glorious brilliance on giving us verse 22. For it says, I praise you for you have heard me and you have become my salvation. So he is using a verse that they already knew to talk about Jesus, who is, is the Savior, that the believer in their lingo, Yeshua, which means Jesus to us, to us could be saved. All right, so there is, if you ever had a wonder about how many ways to heaven, there is salvation and no other. Peter makes it clear, Jesus, Yeshua. And God, when he uh, saw the beauty of this, um, even though they were being persecuted, they came back, they were released out of jail, they shared that sermon and message, and then came back together. They prayed, just thanking God for that experience, and he poured out the Holy Spirit again. Listen to what these apostles and other prayer warriors said that day. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants. Guess what? They didn't act. They didn't ask to be protected. Isn't that interesting? They did not add, don't protect us from going to jail or whatever they want to do to us. Here's what they asked. Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word. With great boldness. It makes me challenge. That doesn't mean meanness or attacking or hating. It means when God opens that door, speaking it clearly and firmly that you believe in Jesus Christ as a savior of your soul. And then he did add this, interestingly. Also stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. So one person being healed caused a crop to come in. Peter says, let's see some more of that. I'd love to see some more people get healed, some more marriages restored, some more people that were suicidal get hope for their life. And as they prayed, as they prayed, the place where they were meeting together was shaken. Woohoo! And everyone in the house was filled with the Holy Spirit, and everyone began to speak the word of God out boldly. So here's, isn't that good? Here's the real question. I'm talking about the harvest out there. We are called first to come to Jesus, right? And then second to go to the world, right? You can't go to the world without coming to Jesus. But when you come to, you, get, you learn of him, then you get sent out. And I feel like as a church, we need to be a sending agency. And not, not just when it's easy. We need to go boldly. We've got a team in a, uh, a Native American reservation right now trying to witness and minister the gospel. Well, that can be risky sometimes. It can be risky going to a neighbor. Maybe you have a Muslim friend at work or whatever it is. But your call is in your context, in your way, by the Holy Spirit, to share the goodness of God and the saving power of Jesus Christ. 
Amen? So I would like us, we're going to have the preaching come back up, but I would like us all to stand and just think, what if Peter and John had just gotten out of jail and come into our room? How would we be praying? We'd be praying excitedly, God, do it again. More healing, more power, but mostly more salvations that people could come to Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and do that. Father, we just love you today. We're thankful for the mercy of God that still saves people. You still love people. You care about people. You are the good, good Father that draws us unto salvation through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And today you are drawing people from our community to yourself. Father, people in this room, people online right now, uh, people that might even watch us later, God, are being drawn to the goodness of God in the land of the living. And Father, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to deliver. And there isn't an addiction, there isn't a pain that you can't heal in a moment in Jesus' name. Now, as you're praying, if you're needing to make a step toward Christ, I'm going to challenge you to come up to these altars here in a moment, and we're going to pray over you. Or if you're, if you're needing to return to Jesus Christ and get that fervor back in your life, we're going to pray a mighty prayer over you. Let's just believe, guys, together. Let's just pray. People are needing encouragement today. Look, the world has drugged them down, and we need to build them up. So we're going to pray for a building up of the Holy Spirit in these folks. And if you also, if you come and you have a healing need, I want you to come up. This is the gospel. Signs and wonders that Jesus might be glorified. These altars are open to you. The only person that would be foolish at this moment is if you had a need and didn't come forward because we love you. We, we just want to love on people and pray for on people and encourage people that we could uh, be a blessing unto you before you leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you Sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus.
we're going to keep playing, so we'll keep a spirit of worship in this room. You're free to head out. Hope you have a great week and socialize out in the lobby.